like I said, last week we started a series basically titled, I don't really have a title, but it's Recapturing Our Passion for God. Today we're going to talk, um, there's like six cages. I've been reading the book that has been, I read it many years ago, and I've, I've, for some reason God brought me back to it, and I believe this is another time for us to uh, kind of deal with it, but uh, there are six cages within this book that they deal with about recapturing your purpose and your passion for God. Today we're going to talk about the first one, and the first one is simply this, the cage of responsibility. The cage of responsibility. Now I'm going to talk to you uh, in a way that you probably will, will not like, but that's, that's kind of how it's going to be today. But um, I believe God has a word for us. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 4, and then we're going to drop down to verse 11. I just want to say uh, welcome back. We see uh, my, my good buddy Ken and Dale are with us today. They're, they're back with us. Uh, Brother Phil is with us again today. Um, and I'm just glad to see, see you guys coming back out. I'm glad to see that things are going well with your families. Uh, we need to continue to pray. We still have people that are sick. We still have people that are suffering. And we just want to continue to pray for them. But I'm glad that everybody has decided to come out and be in the house of the Lord. And I believe God is going to bless you for that. Now, if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 1. And this is what the scripture says. It says, the words of Nehemiah came to the son Hilkiah. Now it happened in the month of Cheslev, the 12th year, as I was in Susa, the, uh, the cadet. Or, and then it goes on to say that his brother came to him because he was at the, the, the castle. He was, he was serving the king. And he, he says his brothers came. One of my brothers came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped. Now, we'll get into Nehemiah and why there's a separation in just a moment. And it says, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me that the remnant there in the providence who had suffered, the, uh, who has survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed. And verse 4 says this, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the Lord or before the God of heaven. The verse 11 says this, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayers of your servant and to the prayers of your servants who delights to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. Father, we love you and we thank you. And I pray right now that you would touch me as I try to bring your word as you would place it on my heart. And I pray, God, that you would open up the ears of those that are hearing here in the building and those are online, God. I pray, Lord God, that you would take away all hindrances within the time that they're watching and in the time that they're here and that you speak deeply to their hearts, God, and they would surrender themselves to you for this moment. They, they can hear what you're trying to tell the church. God, let me speak your words and your words only. I give you praise, I give you honor, I give you glory, and the church said together, amen and amen. Now, I want, I want to paint this into your mind real quick. Our God-ordained passions, our God-ordained passions, tend to get buried beneath our day-to-day -day responsibilities. Our God-ordained passions tend to get buried in our day-to-day responsibilities. There's a, a guy now that this, obviously I've read this book once or twice and, and, I, and I, I had a feeling that I've shared this story with you before, but as any good pastor, you know, as you've been going to churches, pastors share the same stories over and over. So this is, comes my next time of sharing this story. There's a gentleman uh, that you might have known. His name is Wilson Bentley. Wilson Bentley had a very uh, peculiar habit. And he had a very peculiar passion that drove him his whole life. Now, he lived long before us, back in the late 1800s. And he took um, his first picture of a snowflake. I believe it was 1885. His passion was snowflakes. How crazy is that? He loved snowflakes. He would go out during the snowstorms and he would have black velvet or, or black felt papers and he would catch a snowflake and he would study the snowflake and eventually he had the abilities to where he could take pictures of the snowflake 
It said over his lifetime, he took over 5,000 pictures of different snowflakes. And he come to find out that there was absolutely zero duplicates when he looked at the snowflake crystals. Every single one that he took were completely different. But this passion drove him. It drove him so much that he developed pneumonia and he died. Doing and following the passion of his life. My question to you is this. What is your passion or what is your dream? What is the thing that drives your heart more than anything else? What are you doing about this passion? Has everyday life drowned out the fuel of that passion in your life so much that you're not pursuing it anymore? What is your passion? I opened saying that your God-ordained passion. Now, I have a passion for athletic competition. But I do not believe that is my God-ordained passion. That is just a love that I have within my life. But, but I can use that to reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But your God-ordained passion gets buried in everyday responsibilities of your life. It gets buried beneath the bills that you have to pay. It gets buried beneath the relationships within your family that you have to deal with. It gets buried within work and within different things of your life. The things that God has ordained for you to be passionate about and the things that He has placed within your life to, to, to grow passion gets buried under your day-to-day -day activities. And so I'm asking you, what is that? God has placed in each of us a passion and a desire and a longing that is our responsibility to pursue. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 29, 11, I have plans for you. You have a purpose. So if you have a purpose, there is something that has been embedded within your life and in your spirit and your heart that God has given you. But are you pursuing that? Are you allowing everyday responsibility to drain out the life that you are living? It is up to us to follow and to give ourselves to Him in a way that shows our faith is alive within us. There's a devotion that I was reading early this week that goes almost right along with this, so I decided to share it with you. Um, I don't know what devotion it is. It's on the Bible app, but, but this is what it says. It says, the death of a dream or passion is often subtle form of idolatry. The death of a dream or passion is often a subtle form of idolatry. We lose faith in the God who gave us this big dream and settle for a small dream or passion that we can accomplish without His help. We go after dreams and passions that don't require prayer. We go, and, and the God who is able to do immeasurably more than all that our right brain can imagine is supplanted by a God with a lowercase g who fits within the, lo the logical constraints of our left brain. Nothing honors God more than a big dream that is way beyond our ability to accomplish. And he asks the question, why? Because there is no way we can take credit for it. And nothing is better for our spiritual development than a big dream or passion because it keeps us on our knees in raw dependence on God. Now, if that doesn't hit you right between the, your eyes, I don't know what will. Because if you begin to look at your life, and maybe you're not like this, but, but it's been like me. You know, a lot of times our spiritual lives we use as we, we, can, we can draw a step case or a staircase. And we say, you know what, if I can get on the first step, I'll move to the second step. If I move to the second step, I'll go to the third step. But what if God is asking us to go on to the third floor without the steps? You see, that's a big dream. That's a big passion. That's a big thing that we have to overcome. But we get to the point to where we got to go up level by level by level. Because as we go level by level by level, we understand that we can kind of do this thing on our own. And if we're doing this thing on our own, we're not relying on him, as, the, as this devotion says, in raw dependence upon him. And your big dream as the devotion says, comes down to a little dream, and now all you're doing is trying to make things happen, and that has become an idol within your life. Now, that is just an asterisk. That's not even part of my sermon, but you can take that and do what you want to with it. But as you begin to look at the scriptures, as we, we talked about, there has to be a birth of a passion within your life. When you begin to look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah is a man within the Bible that all of us admire. 
We all look up to Nehemiah and we can all learn and we have learned a lot from Nehemiah. There's a lot of uh, leadership courses that are taught from the book of Nehemiah. There's something about Nehemiah that we can glean from. But many times we put him and others within the Bible or even within our lives in a place of elevated status that we cannot reach. I cannot be a Nehemiah because I do not have his, his faith. I can't be Nehemiah because I'm called to be that person. I can't be Nehemiah. You see, we look at Nehemiah as one that is special. Nehemiah rebuilt the wall. Nehemiah was used by God in a mighty way. And as we begin to look at different people within the scriptures, we begin to look at them as that, as the end of the story, we're looking at all they had accomplished by God's help. We forget sometimes to look at him as he is. Do you know who Nehemiah was? Do you really know, if you really get down to the brass tacks, if you will, to who he was, it might surprise you who he was. Now, I'm not going to go into the, the family history of Nehemiah, but Nehemiah was a normal person. He was a servant born in exile. He was a foreigner in a foreign land. Nehemiah was a layman. He had no power. He had no influence. He really had no voice if he began to look at who he, what he did. But he was faithful in his work. He was faithful to what God had placed on his life. Because he was faithful, God began to move and began to birth something in him. Just Nehemiah did not understand what was being birthed in him. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. We found in verse 11, it says that I, now I was a cupbearer to the king. Now if you go and look at what a cupbearer was, Historically, it was an officer of high ranking in the royal courts. We say, hey, I want to be a cupbearer. He is an a, a, a officer of high ranking within the, the whole political system within the land. I have an ear to the king. I am the man. But when you begin to look at what it was, it says whose duties was to pour and serve drinks at the royal table. So if you bring it down to somewhere to where it's on your level, our level, Nehemiah was nothing more than a waiter. Nehemiah was nothing more than a butler that brought drinks to the king when they had big, big parties. This is who he was. Now, he was of high rank because he had to have some, uh, um, uh, some integrity about him because he had to make sure that the king's food and stuff was not poisoned. But that's all he was. If you bring it down, he was a waiter at the White House. Remember, he was exiled, but he was making the best of his life. All of his family and all of his heritage were way back over there in Jerusalem, and he's over here in Babylon doing what he had to do to survive, and he was living. He was placed in Babylon. He was born in Babylon, and, and as, as he was doing that, something happened in his life that led him to the palace, that led him to the king's service, that led him to become a cupbearer. There was something Nehemiah was doing. God places us in strategic places for his purpose. I've already said this many times as I've been here, but you have to understand that you are strategically placed where you are for God's purpose. Strategically placed. You might not understand exactly what's going on. I, I guarantee you, as this thing was beginning to get birth in Nehemiah, he didn't really understand. He was, he was worshiping the God of his land, the God of his people. He was serving the king as he was serving God. He was faithful and honoring those that were above him because that's what the scriptures tell us. That's what a man and a woman of integrity would be. They would be a person that's honoring those that's ahead of them because you know when you honor them, you're honoring God and we live our life every day for him. This is what he was. This is what he was doing. But there has to come a point in time to whenever we, we had this little inkling that something is happening, a need, a need has to be made known. And in verse 3 of our leading scripture, we find out that his brothers come and they tell him of the people. It says, this is the New Living, so this is a different translation, but Jaden has it back there. It's, they see me. 
things are not going well for those who have returned to the providence of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The need, the passion, all of a sudden has now become planted inside Nehemiah because now Nehemiah begins to understand there's something bigger than himself. There's something more than himself. And now he begins to understand there's something to this place of why he is there. He is. God planted a passion deep within Nehemiah's heart through the voice of another. He planted something inside Nehemiah through the voice of his brothers because his brothers were, were where they were Nehemiah wanted to be. Even though Nehemiah was over here living and being very, very, very successful and prosperous, he still wanted to know about his people and about his family and about his homeland. He still wanted to know what was going on with the promised land. Well, why are they like this? And his brothers tell him, well, it's not good. It ain't good, man. The temple's rebuilt, but, but it ain't got no walls. They have no defenses. Everybody's morale is down. They feel disgrace and shameful. They can't hold their heads up. They're not really going to the temple anymore. They're not going to the synagogues anymore. They just, I don't know what we're going to do. Verse 4. Hit Nehemiah. See, Nehemiah did not listen to forget. I'm going to say that again. Nehemiah did not listen to forget. So many times we hear needs of people and within three hours we forget that need of that person until you talk to somebody else. We've, you know, God could use somebody else to bring a need within your life or, or knowledge of a need within your life. And it's because we're not pursuing Him the way we want to. We let everyday responsibilities to drown out the things that God is trying to birth within us. And we have to understand the church has, has become that way. The church has allowed day-to-day -day operations and day-to-day -day responsibilities to drown out and to cover up the things that God has placed us here for in the first place. The cage of responsibility. But if I don't cut the grass out there, nobody's going to come to the church because it's going to look scary. If we don't vacuum the floor, nobody will come to church because it's dirty. If we don't do this, if we don't do that, well, as you're doing all of this, what are you doing to those on the other side of that pavement? What are we doing to those that are down around the corner? What are we doing within that time to where we should be on our face before God, praying for Him to, to break our hearts for what's breaking His? We get, we get so caught up. And let me tell you something. A pastor gets called up in everyday respect. Abilities. There's a lot of things that I do during the day that you might not see. The same way you get caught up within your own life. There's things at your house that you have to do. There's things in your yard you have to do. There's things at work that cause you to work even after you get home. And the one thing that does not take precedent within our life, one thing that does not take the forefront in our life, is Jesus. But it's our every day. It's that cage of responsibility. And we just stay in that cage of responsibility. Nehemiah did not listen to forget, but he allowed it to be internalized and to grow into a holy concern. Nehemiah became overwhelmed with what God had placed in his life. Like I said, verse 4 says, As soon as he heard these words, he sat down and he wept and he mourned for days. Because of what he had heard. Because he understood the heart and the mindset of those that were brought to his attention. He understood where they were. And they continued, and he continued to fast and pray before God of heaven. The needs and the purpose. And the moment began to become who Nehemiah was supposed to be. Nehemiah was born in exile. Nehemiah was in the house. Nehemiah was in the castle. Nehemiah had, had people in his life that could make a change. Nehemiah had people in his life that had power. Well, pastor, I don't have anybody like that. Well, you got the king that's in your life. And he can do things in your life that nobody else can. And we have to understand that. But we allow our responsibilities to overshadow even that. Because we are not who we think that we are. He took what God gave him and faithfully moved to become the hands and the feet of his God. Has God dropped something within your life 
that activated the faith that's inside of you? Has God dropped something in your life, sometime within your life? I'm not talking about like last week. Now, some of you could have been last week. But did God drop something within your life when you came to, to live your life for Him? Has He dropped something within your life? And now, as you begin to look back years and years and years past, that you said, you know what? God places in my heart, and I've never really had the satisfaction, the joy that I wanted because I've allowed my everyday life to get in way of what God wanted me to do. Has He placed something there? Has God allowed you to see or to hear or experience something that has caused sleepless nights, days of tears and longing and desire to change the current condition of eyes affected by what you've been exposed to. Our greatest responsibility is pursuing our God ordained passions. I'm going to say that again. No matter who you think you are, no matter who we think we are, I'm, going to, I'm not going to try to talk ugly to you, no matter who we think we are, our greatest responsibilities is to pursue our God-ordained passion that is in place in our life. It doesn't matter if you're a forklift. It doesn't matter if you cut grass for a living. It doesn't matter if you're unemployed. It doesn't matter if you're the top guy in your office or the top guy in your business. It, it doesn't matter if you're a pastor or a church. There are things God has placed within us and He has ordained for us. The Bible tells us that He gives us the desires of our hearts. The Bible says that sometimes, and sometimes you have to interpret that as He places those desires within us to compel us to move. But responsibility and our greatest responsibility is to go after those God-ordained passions. I have this to, 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 for you to see. It says, when God puts a passion in your heart, that God-ordained passion becomes your responsibility. You see, some of us will look at the people down in, in Lake Charles and uh, Moss Bluff and all that, and you say, well, you know, that community needs to rise up. That community needs to do, do that. They need to, 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 you know, buckle up their shoes and tighten their belts and just build that community back up. But what happens if God placed that passion in your heart and you understand it's not just a compassion because of what you see on TV. You understand it's not just a compassion that you see all over the world. I'm going to change my mic because I think I'm still going in and out. I got blue. But you have to understand that, that whenever God gives you this passion, He gives you this passion because He has something for you to do. And because he's given it to you to do, you can't push it off on somebody else. You can't push it off on another organization that might have more money or might have more, more reach or might have more this or that. God has placed something within your life that has caused you to be in a place to reach out and to do the things that he has placed. He has never placed something in your heart that he has not prepared you for. Now, you might not think that you're qualified. You might not think that you have it all together. But if God has placed you in this place, and if God has placed his passion in you, he has done it because he has placed you strategically to make a difference in the lives of others that's going to give him the glory. We have to move past what you can do. You have to understand and accept you will never fulfill a God-given passion without His help. You will never fulfill a God-given passion without His help. Because He's not going to put something in you small. It's going to be something bigger than anything else that you've ever, ever had to deal with. If you don't have faith or if you don't have to use your faith to accomplish what's ahead, it's not a God-given passion or dream or direction. If you do not have to use faith to accomplish what's ahead, it is not a God-given passion or dream or direction. If we can do it on our own, we will get the glory, and he will not. Nehemiah spent months praying and seeking and preparing himself for what was ahead. 
if you begin, if you go to chapter two, we'll go there in a moment, you'll find out that he spent five months of praying and fasting and weeping before God before he got to a place to where he can approach the king to what was going to happen. Months of what God had planted in him for somebody else. Rebuilding the wall was going to do absolutely nothing for Nehemiah. Rebuilding the wall was going to do nothing for his life, for he was not living there. He was living in Babylon. It was not going to do anything. But he knew that this was a God-given passion, and sometimes your God-given passion will bring absolutely nothing back to you. But it was all going to go for God. And we have to begin to live our life to understand that we don't need to get any type of credit. We don't need get any type of, of experience, if you will. But we need to give everything to God and allow God to be the man and the person that gets all the glory. Because he is the king of kings and he's the one that places in us. But when we start grabbing it for ourselves, we begin to put ourselves up above where we need to be. And in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, In the early spring, in the month of Nisan, that's probably how you say it. If not, that's okay. During the 12th year of the same year, it says, I was serving the king his wine. I'd never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? Don't, or you don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. You see, there comes a point in time to when you follow after God's passion. And you allow this to be the thing that, that drives you and fuels you. People are going to begin to see there's a difference in you. People are going to begin to see there's something else about you. And when they begin to see that, they're going to begin to ask. Nehemiah did not react on a whim when God placed something in his spirit. He stayed responsible, just available. For five months, he prayed and he cried and he fasted before God, but he still served drinks to the king. For five months, he prayed and he fasted before God, but he still went to the banquets and did all of his duties that God had placed upon him as he was the cupbearer to the king. And as he was doing that, he did that with a face that the king never knew something was going on. But there comes a point in time to in this passion, and you give yourself fully to the passion that God has ordained for you, and you fully give it to him. There comes a point in time to where it will take over, and nothing else is going to bring you joy or happiness. And you might be looking at yourself and saying, well, I have not been happy in a long time, so I'm going to pose a question to you. Are you pursuing the God-ordained passion that he's placed? Placed in your heart. The Bible tells us every one of us has a purpose. Every one of us has a plan. And every one of us has a different passion that God is going to place in us. Are we seeking that with everything that we have? Nehemiah did not want to walk up the escalator in the wrong direction. You say, well, that makes no sense. You think about it. So many of us spend our time with God in prayer and seeking God, God, all you got to do is do this. And we get on the escalator. And if you get on the escalator, the wrong direction, you're walking up as the escalator's coming down. And if you go the same speed of the escalator, what happens? You go absolutely nowhere. But you're, 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 you're spending energy. You're spending time. You're here. God, I've been faithful for two years going up this escalator. And you ain't changed the direction so I believe that I still got to pray. I'm still going to pray. I'm still going up this escalator, God. You said you're going to move the mountain. I'm going to go up this escalator. I'm going to go it up. I'm going to do it. And that's how we spend our time as we try to go after the passions that God has placed in us. We're going up an escalator in the wrong direction instead of turning around and saying, well, the escalator is going back. Let me turn around and let me look and see where God is, is trying to take me. So many times we fight after God and we fight with God because we don't want to take responsibility for the passion and the purpose that he places on our life because it's not good enough for us. We start dying when we have nothing to live for. And we don't really start living until we find something to die for. Think about it. This is where we are. We die when we don't have something to live for. Nehemiah was set for life. He was comfortable. He was secure. He was not worried about his future. 
Think about it. He was working in the White House. And it makes no difference what position you have in the White House. If you are faithful in the White House, you are set for life. You don't have to worry about it. The most secure place in the world, you've got all these people of power, of influence. All you got to do is be friends with them, be a man and woman of integrity. And you got everything. He was working for the president of Babylon. There's nobody more powerful than the president. Nobody more powerful than the king. And he had face-to-face -face with him every single day. He didn't know why. But he began to understand after God placed something in him, why he was placed, why he was birthed in a place of exile, away from the promise of God, in a place over here that had conquered the promise of God. And he was birthed here. Now he was serving the king that was pushing people out. He was serving the king that had, had conquered them. And Well, he didn't conquer them, but, you know, his, his, his regime did. His country did. They conquered him. I'm serving this king. But my heart's over there. Why am I doing this? Because God had a plan. Because the Bible said that even though you walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. But then the Bible said that he's going to prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. I don't know about you, but I don't think there's been a better table prepared in the presence of an enemy than as Nehemiah began to set these things out before the king. And as he set the things out for the king, the king grew fond of Nehemiah because of his faithfulness and because he had, a, he had the ability to be who he was. It didn't matter who was around him. And as the king began to notice something different about Nehemiah's appearance and something different about his demeanor, he said, Nehemiah, what is wrong with you? You don't look sick. You have never been in my presence looking like this. That You must be deeply troubled. And Nehemiah began to lay out what was going on. King, you don't understand. My people are suffering. My people are disgraced. My people are shameful. They're, they're, they have no defense for those that are coming around them. And he began to tell the king what was going on. We have to stop hiding behind excuses. We must be driven by faith and fulfilling the Father's will no matter what. Daily, self-achievable goals cannot govern our lives. Self-achievable goals cannot govern our lives. Our days cannot be filled with only the attainable. There has to be a stretching within your life. When you begin to look at the scripture that came to my mind, Matthew chapter 8, verse 21, 22, it says this. Jesus is talking to one of the the disciples, not one of the twelve, but one of the disciples that were following him. He says, another disciple said to him, Lord, go first and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. And a lot of us would read that scripture and say, well, Jesus is a little bit heartless. Why can't I go bury my own dad? Well, why can't I do this? But when you begin to look at that scripture, you begin to understand exactly what was going on. See, back in those days, everybody was buried either the day they died or the day after. And so for the disciple to say, let me go bury my dad, what he really was saying was, listen, my dad ain't got much longer to live, a couple years. Let me go spend life with him. Then after he dies, I will come and find you, and then I will follow you after I take care of this daily responsibility that I have. And so now he is caught in the cage of responsibility because he wants to deal with this. After this is done, then I will be free to come and follow after you. And we get to the place to where that is where we are. We want to do what God wants us to do after we do what we want to do. When it comes to doing the will of God, God-ordained passions are far more important than any human qualifications we can bring to the table. God often uses us at our greatest point of weakness or incompetencies. Nehemiah could have stayed, but his faith and his desire pushed him. He could have lived only the attainable, but the love of his father moved him. Responsible in this book, it talks about irresponsible responsibilities and responsible irresponsibilities. I know that's a tongue twister. But it goes on to say this: it says responsible irresponsibilities means refusing to allow our human responsibilities to get into the way of pursuing the passions God has placed in our hearts. See, so many of us have that backwards. We're irresponsible 
with the responsibilities God has given us. Because when God gives us a passion, like I said earlier, it becomes your responsibility. Once God gives you something, it's kind of like when we talk about our children at the age of accountability. Well, really, when are they accountable for their own actions? When are they accountable for this or for that? When God gives you something, you automatically become responsible and accountable to that. If we get to the point where we allow our lives to push us back, we allow our lives to hold us back into the cage and not move forward for where God is. We are no longer pursuing the passions God has given us. That's why we're talking about recapturing those passions that God has given us, recapturing that joy and that, that love, recapturing that life that we can have through Him. Nehemiah stopped praying. This is my final point. He stopped praying and started doing. We use the excuse of prayer to cover up our lack of faith and willingness to give ourselves. I'm going to say that again because you don't like it. We use the excuse of prayer to cover up our lack of faith or our willingness to give ourselves. Now, I want to put a little stop right here. You cannot live life without prayer. That is not what I'm saying. But so many of us do not move forward because we have to pray and hear the right thing from God before we begin to move. We use the excuse of prayer. How many of you, as your pastor, not me, but all your pastors throughout your whole life, or somebody, a school, a, a Sunday school teacher, or somebody like that. How many of you have been approached to do something at the church? What's your first thing? Well, let me pray about that for a minute. After I pray about it, I'll get back with you. And so many times, about a month later, we come back and say, well, have you heard from God yet? I'm still praying, brother. I'm still praying. Bless God. He's going to talk. He's going to talk. Really, I believe he's already spoken to you because... You know, you're just afraid to step out. And we got to get to the point where Nehemiah was. What would happen if Nehemiah stayed under the excuse of prayer and continued to pray and fast? God sent somebody to build that wall. God sent somebody to, to bring joy back to these people. God sent somebody. And God is saying, shut up and listen. I'm sending you. Quit praying and begin to do something. You've got to go out and move. You've got to live. You've got to allow me to use you. You see, why do we ask God? And this is something from that book that, that just hit me right in the forehead. And it might hit you. I hope it does. If it don't, you know, sorry. Why do we ask God for something that for us? Why do we ask God something for us when it is within our power to do that same thing for ourselves? Why do we ask God for something when we have the power to do it ourselves? Why? We wait for God to part the waters of our problems, but our feet never get wet. I want you to think about it. Think about whenever they cross the Jordan River. They've already crossed the Red Sea. They're going across the Jordan River. And what happens? Does God plant part the water right away? No, it says when the priest's feet touch the water, the water begin to part. So many times we want God to part everything out of the way and make everything crystal clear for us. And after it's crystal clear, we'll go, but I can't walk through the water. My loafers might get wet. I can't walk through the clouds. I might run into a tree. I can't walk through this because I don't see what's in front of me. The Bible says that we have to walk by faith, not by sight. And we have to get to the point to where we're going to walk right into the middle of the problem because that's what God is asking us to do. And as we walk right into the middle of the problem, it will begin to exercise the faith that he's placed inside of us and begin to follow after the passion that he has birthed and ordained for us. Then we begin to see him move like never before. But we have to move first we have not moved in faith into the rivers of difficulty because we expect God to part the river first we have to make the first step we have to act Nehemiah quit praying after five months and he went to the king and he told the king and in the king's presence he gained favor because he says father in heaven 
I'm done praying. I'm going to start moving in faith. Because he said earlier in chapter 1, give me favor, for I'm just a cupbearer. I know I am nobody, but God give me favor. He moved out to respond to the passion that, and desire that God placed in him because he was the one to accomplish that task. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 6, it goes on to say, and this is what I want you to see, and this is what I'm going to be done. Derek, if you want to come play softly. In verse 6, it says this. The king said to me, with the, king, with the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him my answer. I want you to understand this, and this is where we miss God so many times. This is where we miss God when we're trying to, to follow the passion that he's placed in us. Sometimes the ordained, the God-ordained passion that's in your life is temporary. Sometimes there is an end date. Sometimes it is not an open door for you just to go and leave and never come back. Now, the Bible says Nehemiah stayed gone a long time, but he returned back to his post. But you have to understand that when you're saying yes to God, you're not saying, yes, I'm going to go live in Ecuador. I'm, I'm going to go live in, in the Arctic Circle. I'm going to go do this, and this is where I'm going to be. But God might be saying, I need you to go out there for three years. I need you to go out there for Johnny. I need you to go out there for Timmy. And once you reach Timmy, I need you to come back. Because I got something else for you. But you need to go. You need to be willing to go as long or as short as I'm asking you to go. And the only way that we can do that is to follow him with everything that we have. Live, uh, lay our life down and say, God, wherever it is you're telling me to go, I'm going to go. Nehemiah did just that. We're not going to talk about building the wall. See, today is all about him leaving his post, him leaving the security and the comfortability of where his life was and going to a place to where he had no idea what he was going to find. All he knew that he was going to find enemies. All he knew he was going to find there was going to be no defenses, but he was going to go build the defenses. We are called to follow God. Sometimes our office is temporary. Sometimes our titles never change. When Christianity turns into a noun, it becomes a turnoff. There was a, a lady in history that we all know. And when I found this story, it was, it was kind of eye-opening to me. But there was a lady named um, Agnes. Do you know Agnes? Agnes is pretty powerful within her own rights. Agnes had a God-ordained passion within her heart. And she followed that God-ordained passion. And she got counsel from some mothers that were above her in the faith. And they said, well, Agnes, what do you have? She said, I've got three pennies and God. Well, you can't do much with three pennies. But I've got God. And Agnes went and lived. And she lived in Calcutta. And we know her now as Mother Teresa. And we all know everything that Mother Teresa did. We all know the great things that she did for all those that were downtrodden and all the orphans and all the people that had nothing in Calcutta. And they asked her, well, how would you tell this to somebody? Or, or, or how would you tell somebody to, to follow their passions? And she said, find your own Calcutta. Find your own place. To fulfill God's. So you have to understand that ordained passions are not necessarily in the church. There are stories of people leaving the, the Department of Justice and leaving big law firms to go and to fight against uh, uh, sex trafficking and to fight against this. There's others that, that, that left architectural companies and going out and using their knowledge and their passion for God to build communities for those that didn't have anything. You see, your ordained passion is something God has placed you in right now. And He has given you something that you can help the world with. You just got to be able to give it over to Him because He's already given it to you and use it for His glory. What would happen if we had all the, the construction and the electrical guys within the church and said, you know what? We're going down to where the hurricane hit and we rebuilt that whole place. And they used everything that they had, all their knowledge, all their experience. That would be their Calcutta. 
And they will build it back up and get that community back up. Do you have that experience? What about right around the corner? What about right across the street? What about downtown where you have batter women? We, we got a batter women's place right across the street in the next neighborhood. If you can't go in. They won't let you in, but you can drop stuff off. What happens if, if somebody in here had a heart for that? And that's where your Calcutta was. That, that's where your passion led you. That's where you had to come out of your cage of everyday responsibility and said, I'm not watching TV no more, but I've got to go do something for these people. i got to do something for these ladies. i got to do something for these gentlemen. You see, your passion, God has placed inside of you. But until you give it back to Him, it will be fruitless. I believe that.